Hi, welcome to our first episode of Hot Off the Shelves. My name is Kara, and this is Sonali. We are two friends from high school. We still live in our hometown, San Diego. And I remember having a book club in high school with some of our friends. And so this is kind of like a recreation of that, where we have our own little book club, but in podcast form. And we get to share with you our reflections on books and um, how they resonate in 2020 slash 2021. Yeah, 2021. Oh my gosh, we are basically in 2021. 2020 was a, a trip. Anyway, yes. <laughs> so let's get down to this. So the book that we chose today was The the Midnight Library by Matt Haig. Uh, you want to tell them a little bit about the, uh, the hypnosis and the author? Yeah, so Matt Haig is a British novelist. He's written some memoirs in the past about his experiences with severe depression and um, so this book is kind of also going off of his experiences, but this is fiction. So it's kind of um, it's kind of based on his experiences with depression, but it's about a young woman. Well, she's actually she's in her 30s, so she's not that young. But um, her name's Nora Seed, and she one day overdoses because she everything in her life is just going wrong like she lost her job she um lost her best friend her cat died so everything's going wrong and she decides she doesn't want to live anymore so she overdoses she writes suicide notes and then instead of dying she wakes up in this place called the midnight library and she's given an opportunity to choose other options for lives so she gets to like go back and forth and she instead of um, having the job that she had one in one life, she has the option to be a glaciologist studying glaciers. And in another life, she's an Olympic swimmer and she just gets to try out all of these options. And the hope is that she'll find a life that she actually likes. And so the whole book is about, you know, trying out different things and getting rid of regrets because she feels like her whole life is just regrets and um and I think this is something that like a lot of us wonder in our lives like what if I studied something else in college um what if I you know studied psychology would my life have turned out differently would I be happier or more successful yeah definitely I mean you know I I'm currently a student and uh, and I, it's been a journey getting my bachelor degree and and I have always kind of wondered like what what would have happened if I were to just study a little bit more if I didn't go to uh, this certain event or I didn't pursue uh, this major and that major I mean we we all have those moments I'm sure yeah, yeah. what if I didn't marry that person exactly or- so uh, this book expl- uh, explores all that um, and you know I didn't know anything about this author or this book uh, like I said um, I work at a library and I just saw this book on the shelf on our new shelves so I was like oh pretty cool cover I mean it it kind of reminds me of like kind of traveling again I don't know anything about this book and I love this like dark navy I don't know what color you would call it but dark blue color so I I just grab it I literally grab it off the shelf uh (laughs) <laughs> hot off the shelves yeah and the cover is kind of cool actually I don't know if you can see it up here but um there are all of these different little windows and we find out that the windows are kind of representing portals because they're all the different lives that she can possibly live all the possibilities yeah well um originally I thought they were representing like airplane windows because you know if you look at it you you have those little oval windows but no after you read the book you realize that oh these are portals um yeah so well let's get down to the discussion of this book what was your first reaction when you were reading oh that's a good question okay so i thought not gonna lie the first half was a little slow yeah, it, it was slow for me, and I was like, okay, it's a very interesting book, and I understand that it deals with depression and it deals with mental health, and it is a good book to read. And I mean, after all, it is a New York Times bestseller, right? I mean, it has to be New York Times bestseller for a reason. Yeah, but that being one... said, um, it was a little slow for me. What about you? Uh, what What was your your initial yeah. reaction? I I think at first it was so. 
dark and heavy that I felt like I had to take it in small doses. Like I had to, I was listening to it in audiobook, so I could only listen for like 10 minutes at a time. And then I had to like tune out and do something else because it was just so like heavy. But then um, I got more into it and I started to like relate to her or like, I don't know, I just... I started like connecting to it more and it's it's definitely not like a fast paced book a lot of what's happening is in her mind it's a very like um cerebral like philosophical book like because she's like literally like in a like coma or something she's unconscious and all of this stuff is happening kind of in her mind and then she has um these conversations with this person the um the librarian in the midnight library who helps her like kind of talk through all of these things and she has all these breakthroughs when she's talking to this woman but um there's not a lot of like action and things like that it's just like it's a lot of talking a lot of thinking there is like some dialogue but not even a lot of dialogue yeah i would say that most dialogues are introspective uh the Menhe does a really good job of portraying uh, these issues that everybody have and, you know, that these issues that we we should be aware of. But um, the dialogue, on the other hand, is not necessarily what how we would talk day to day is really just I see it more as like like her thoughts. Her this is just all the talks in her in her brain, and which I mean it is because she is in a limbo. Everything yeah. that is happening to her is you know is through her mind. Uh, but that is one of the I would say uh, a little bit of a weakness in this book is that the dialogue is not as flowy as I would like it to be. It's not as natural. Uh, what would you say? For you, did it ever become faster? Like, did the book... I know you say it was slow to read and you couldn't take it in in the beginning, but did it ever become easier to read or listen to since you got an audiobook? I, yeah, I don't, I don't think it was difficult, but I started, like, enjoying it more um, just because there were so many lines that really, like, resonated with me. Um, or... I, I think not even resonating, but there like there were so many lines that were just so well written. I think he's a very like poetic writer, and there were so many like metaphors and um, analogies he made that um, were just like so beautifully written that I was like that was such a nice way to express that. And um, I just have like all of these like quotes written down, and and I feel like this is this is honestly a book that I would like reread. Really? Um, which isn't something I can say very often. So definitely a compliment to Matt Haig. Yeah. Oh. He's a good writer. Oh, he definitely is. Yeah. I mean, aside from my criticism, I mean, this this book is phenomenal. And um, yeah, it was a very interesting story to read. And it just have a lot of a lot of current events issues uh, associated with it. I mean, depression, you know, especially... Especially in America, depression rate is not just in America, actually. Uh, almost every yeah. uh, first world country, like depression rate is going way high up. And, and that could be because we're just now becoming more aware of it. Or it's just the nature of how we do things in first world or other Western um, industries. Yeah, I think especially with... Um um, the pandemic this year, I think a lot more people are alone and not having the connection that, you know, they're used to. And, um, and I think the main character kind of deals with similar things. Like she, she has friends at different points in her life and she has like relationships, but somehow she doesn't feel like she really belongs anywhere. And that's why I think she keeps like sliding between lives that's what she's called the slider someone who like slides mm -hmm. between lives and she's actually not the only one who does this she meets other characters who are like secret sliders they um confide in her that they've been like sliding between lives also yeah so one of the character uh, of one of the slider is called hugo and so hugo has been 
in this limbo for longer than she is. But unlike her, Hugo is actually in a coma, in a medical coma. So his situation is a little different from Nora. Uh, but that being said, all these sliders have one thing in common, according to him, which is they have this little sanctuary. Um, for Noah, it's a midnight library. For Hugo, it was a video game shop. And they always have this one, I w- what would you call it, personal guidance, I guess, guidance counselor, um, or like godlike figure. So like for Nora, it's the, the librarian. And for Hugo, it was his uncle. And for other people, it's, you know, somebody who has shown deep interest in them or kindness in them like that but it's always always one person which is very interesting because this book doesn't really touch on on spirituality or or religion as much but if you think about it a lot of people are religious I mean uh I mean I'm not religious but I I know a lot of people my parents are and you know a lot of people go to churches temples um mosque and they pray to their god and and most of the time you always hear somebody saying something like god listen to me god help me um do go this way god help me answer um something sort of that like and then you know just the parallelism you can't ignore that because the the church is like that sanctuary place kind of like midnight library and then most of the religions is uh, only um it's monotheism so like it's one god and you know mrs elm the midnight library or like hugo's uncle kind of represent like that god almost and and i just thought that was a very interesting parallelism um i don't know if it was intentional or not but i just thought that was pretty cool Yeah. yeah i think um these types of like sanctuaries, whether it's the midnight library or a church, are places where um, they're usually quiet. So there is space for reflection and you know grounding yourself and um, just like reflecting on your life. And I I'm curious if Nora had more religion in her life. Maybe if she was connected to church or something, um, if she would have had the same issues that she did have like maybe she wouldn't have had had as much depression or maybe she would have felt more connected that would be a a very interesting portal to go to um you know she did go to a lot of things she was a lot of a lot of Nora's even though she finds something that she thinks she enjoys it uh which uh, what she did near the end, like where she uh, was with Ash and with her daughter in this other universe. But because she jumped in the middle, not like she didn't start from the beginning. She she realized that she is loved and she realized that she is um, she matters. But I don't think she felt the the peace that she wanted from the beginning. Yeah. Yeah. I think that ties into one of the other themes that um that resonated with me is about identity and so yeah she's living this life I I think this is probably like the 50th life she's had so she's done all of these other lives that for some reason didn't feel quite right for her and then she asked the librarian to be taken to another life where she um, accepts a coffee date invitation to this with this guy that she said no to when he first asked her out in her actual life. And so the librarian takes her to this life where um, she says, yes, I'll go on this coffee date with you. And she finds out that just because she said yes to that coffee date, she ends up like married to this guy. His name's Ash and she has a daughter and, um, but, and she seems very happy, but there's this like sentence that um, she says, like when she has this breakthrough, when she's thinking about this life, where she says, um, I was carbon copied into the perfect life, but it wasn't me. Mm-hmm. That resonated with me because I think about like how even if we had made like perfect choices, if they weren't our choices, then it like probably wouldn't feel right for us either. Yeah, Um that was a pretty powerful moment when she had that breakthrough. There were a few times where she you know, she wanted to live. Uh, she no longer wanted to die. So 
basically uh so in the beginning she was like okay this identity this nora in real life she wants nothing to do with it uh absolutely not a but then and then she goes through a few things and then she just she was just disappointed and uh at some i remember in this one uh life where she actually meets hugo uh where she was a glaciologist uh because that was the first time too that she kind of chose chose something that she would want to do not necessarily what other people want to do but granted it is still being driven by you know the, uh, by her, the real school librarian now besides that point i just remember in that episode she was guarding she was as a, a, a what was the position point guard uh lookout lookout person hmm. she was a lookout person and basically her duty was she had to look out for the polar bear if the polar bear comes while the other are the others are doing research that she just have to um fire up the flare gun and uh uh what was it the bang the pots and pans really loud so that so that the bear will will go away if war is comes to war she has to kill the bear with a rifle so so you know she has never been afraid of death before she in fact she i mean she you know, they had overdose, so obviously she's not afraid of it. But at that moment, when the bear came, she all of a sudden want to live. She was afraid of dying, which, which is interesting because a part of me is like, does she like that identity? But she doesn't necessarily like the glaciologist, I Nora. She she likes, but then she doesn't particularly like her own, like her real life either. Yeah, she so she um she really wants to be taken back to the midnight library when she's facing this encounter with the bear and she's really frustrated because she's not being taken back to the library and she realizes that it's not enough to be um scared of life. You have to be disappointed in a life. And this was a life that um she hadn't been disappointed enough. Because um, even though it didn't feel quite right, she was still exploring it. She was still getting to know Hugo and getting to know the glaciologist world. Um, And so she goes back to the library eventually. And then she's like reflecting with the Midnight Librarian again. And the Midnight Librarian helps her like kind of process all this and helps her choose another life. At some point, she's like, "I, um, I I feel like I'm always stuck. What does she say? She's she's like, I feel like being part, being stuck is just part of who I am, yeah. and so, um, like maybe that's just part of my identity, and and then she she has to be taken to a life where she's not stuck. But the librarian isn't the one who's like driving all this. It's all Nora's like choices. Actually, the librarian's just helping her um, pick out lives, but it's actually all in Nora's ability to choose yeah so yes definitely because i mean everything is happening in her head and everything is just her imagination so it's not like although it seems like Miss, mrs l the librarian is the one pushing it but but it's not uh in fact mrs l reminded her a few times throughout the books that you have to tell me i can only show you where it is but you have to tell me what you want would you say that starting, let's say, that episode, uh, not episode, that chapter where she uh, she found a polar bear, would you say that that was her kind of like tipping point to where she started to love herself again? I think it was definitely a gradual process because even after that, um, she went back to the library and she said, um, I no, I am scared of death, but I still believe that the life I was living wasn't one worth living. So she's like, even if I had to go back to regular life, like I don't care enough. She wasn't that invested anyway. And I think it it was a long journey to get to the point where she was actually interested in life again. True, yeah. That was kind of like the beginning of like how she started yeah. to value her life a little bit more. Yeah. I mean, granted, it took her you know 50 something plus more lives until she get to ash and molly that she was like okay i want to live i am alive but um but i will say that little polar bear incident was one of the stepping stones stepping stone for Mm -hmm. her to slowly self-love again so talking about self-love 
what, what, how would you, is there anything that she did in this book that you think you can, we can apply to our lives? Yeah, definitely. I think there were a lot of things where, that helped her, um, you know, become the person that she was capable of being. Something as simple as like spending time with a child. I think um, it was funny because I think that the daughter that she had in one of her alternate lives, Molly, was kind of what um, brought her back to life because she was she was actually like happy in that life and. Maybe just because I think um, she saw herself like reflected in this daughter and she like the daughter um, seemed like braver than Nora was. And she was kind of inspired by that because the daughter went biking one day and she didn't really cry. She she just kept repeating, um, I'm OK, I'm OK, I'm OK. And so Nora was like, wow, she's braver than I am. And she's like five years old. So um I think that inspired her to like power through more of life yeah. kind of. So maybe like um, exposing ourselves to people that inspire us, even if it's like little kids. So like age doesn't matter if it's someone that makes you, you know, feel powerful um, and, and just like bring positivity into our lives. I think that's worth it. Yeah. Uh, and I'm glad that you said that scene because one of the things that I try to do whenever, you know, and I struggle with this too. And I mean, everybody struggles with this, but one of the things that I try to tell my friends whenever they are, they are being Nora where, you know, I'm unworthy. I don't deserve it. They don't deserve me, blah, blah, blah. Right. And I always tell them, would you tell me the same thing if I were you? Would you tell me those things if I was the one, you know, facing those problems I mean it's not would you you know like if I came to you uh, with my problem you're not gonna be like Kara you're worthless Kara you're not worthy of this Kara you need to give up you're not gonna tell me that yeah so so you know why do we do that and so then I always tell my friends like treat yourself as you would treat me if I were to come to you have a problem and that's kind of I how I feel like that scene was too because Nora saw Molly and kind of in like Nora saw Molly as kind of herself, you know, when younger, and she would never tell Molly all the things she tells herself, and and I think at that point she also kind of knew that she doesn't deserve those words either. The those thought, those negative thought that she's been telling her, so like she should, she I think she's slowly realizing that she doesn't deserve those. She deserves a cheerleader, even if it's just herself, and I think Molly. And Ash helped show her that. Yeah. Yeah. And then um, also people like the librarian is actually just a reflection of Nora. Because she's, uh, the librarian is a creation that Nora created in her head. And um, the librarian helps her like process all this stuff. But it's actually just Nora processing with herself. And, um, and so... I think to some extent we can do that with a therapist or things like journaling and things like that. So those are all practices that we can bring into our life. Oh, definitely. And I know you do a little bit of bullet journaling. I mean, I I used to do diary, but I I just write so much that I kind of stopped doing diary. But it's something that I want to go back to. Yeah. Um, yeah. Talking, going with the self-love and then with the identity thing here. Would you say that our identity, even Nora's identity, is it created by herself or is it created by others? I think um, I think she definitely has to decide what she wants in her life. But um, to some extent, like some of the lives that she lived, she thought that she, because she did something or she didn't do something, um, everything would be different, but something still stayed the same. So um, sometimes, like, no matter what you do, other things stay the same. But you can always control your own choices. Like, you can decide what you want to study. And no matter what, like, she was okay. Like, in all of her lives, she was she was fine. But it was deciding what she actually wanted to do that made the difference. Definitely. Yeah, uh, that is a question that I often ask myself too. I often ask my friends, like, 
oh, what do you think of me? Um, which I'm pretty sure I've asked you that many, many times. Yes, it is yeah. something we talk about a lot. <laughs> yes. And part of it is that, you know, when somebody asks me, explain yourself, right? I don't know how exactly to explain myself. Like, what am I? Who am I? Yeah, like in a yeah. job interview or something yeah. where someone says, tell me about yourself. So... I and I kind of just curious on what my friends think of me, and then most of the time they gave me like similar answer. But once in a while they give me a very odd answer, um, or like a very different answer, and then I was like, oh, that's that's interesting. I never really saw myself that way. I think another thing is she, because she gets to live so many alternate lives, she gets to try out what the librarian calls ultimate endless possibilities. And the librarian keeps reminding her over and over again. This is a line that actually gets repeated many times that um, there are there's no shortage of possibilities. And the opposite of possibilities is death. And the other way around, too. The opposite of death is possibilities. And she only has possibilities. So I think that's true in our life, too. Like, there's there's no point where we run out of possibilities for ourselves. And we can just keep exploring and exploring until we find things that actually work for us. Yeah. But like we can we can change our career, we can try out new relationships and and there's no point where it's like too late to turn back. Definitely. Our possibilities can be influenced by others, kind of like how Nora was influenced uh, by others and throughout many lives, you know, at one point she was a rock star. Rock star, that was because of her brother, her brother's dream. She was a Olympic swimmer because of her dad's dream. Uh, and then glaciologist is kind of like her dream slash the Mrs. Elm's dream. And then, um, so it can be influenced by other, but at the bottom line, there there's just infinite, infinite possibilities. Mm-hmm. And you have to make the decision. I have to make the decision. And yes, my life has been influenced by my parents. I mean, lots of people have. Uh, my, my friends, lots of people have been influenced by their friends. Uh, or even, you know, the surroundings, like where we live, and then where, uh, or even the government. But at the end of the day, even if we feel like we don't have a choice, that's the choice that we made. And, and we get to see that over and over in this book yeah so um for some discussion questions what was one character that you didn't like in this book oh okay well there would be two characters technically um mainly because because uh, I can't choose between the two. The first one is Nora herself, not going to lie. I, in the beginning, you know, she, I think I, it, it, she just kind of annoyed me in a sense because I think I've been trying to work on self-positivity lately and mm-hmm. then, and this is something that I have seen throughout my life with other people with these self doubt, and then there's no talking through them, and mm-hmm. and no matter how much you try, there's no talking through them, and then and then that that was kind of annoying to me. But at the same time, do I do I know where they're coming from? Oh, definitely. I mean, I've been there. I we all have been there. But still, that was one of the the little bit of uh, her character that I was like, oh. This is going to be a long time talking. Yeah. But the other character that I personally do not like is uh, Dan, one of her ex-boyfriend. Oh, one mm-hmm. of the guys that she... Well, in this, in her real life, she was about to marry him. But then she broke up with him, I think, I think two days before the the wedding. Something like yeah. that. Um, and, you know, in other lives, we we see that he was kind of a stalker, even though she broke up with him, especially in the rock star, rock star life, uh, he was a huge stalker. She had to have a restraining order against him. And in another life, um, he, even though they were, got married, yeah, even though they got married, he still cheated on her, and then he just like, oh, it was a one-time thing, or a two-time thing, kind of like brush it off. And... He was just a bad influence 
to her. Yeah. So that would be the opposite of what we want in our life. Yeah. I think people who make us feel like worthless and, you know, all this talk about self-love and, and things like that. Like you can only have so much self-love if there are always people like Dan bring you down. So, you know, you have to get rid of those kinds of people. Yeah. What about you? Who is your least favorite character? Um, I think, uh, well, I don't know if I would say least favorite, but, um, I think that one boyfriend, Dylan. Oh, yes, yes. Um, the, Dylan's the, the boy that she, uh, the boy that she has seen since grade school, and he's kind of like in the background, he's kind of like, you know, that, that kid in the corner, but that's, Th- that's just there um and he works at a animal shelter right and then he yeah he works at an animal shelter yeah, and he loves dogs yeah. he always lets dogs sleep with him in his bed and he is training um uh he is rehabilitating this sally this dog named sally the mastiff anyway so why do you not like him i don't dislike him necessarily but he just seemed um like he wouldn't be bringing a lot he wouldn't be like contributing much to Nora's life I think maybe because she wasn't in love with him and she realized this at some point that the actual the Nora that was actually in his life was in love with him and he deserved someone like that and um and so he just seemed like he wasn't he was she described him as kind of dorky and he seemed kind of like um you know, not, not like the maybe the exciting person that she was yeah. hoping for or something. And there's not much cap- character development with him either, because like we see a lot of Dan and we see a lot of Ash and you know Mr. Salmon and all that, but he was one of the few characters that that she you know experienced one of her lives with, and yet there wasn't that much character development for him. Hmm. I think there was as much as um, as much as there were for the other characters, but I think that's that's kind of my point. Like we we didn't see as much of him because maybe there wasn't as much to him. He was kind of he wasn't boring, but he was kind of a simple person. Yeah. Like he he just loves dogs. Like he's um, happy with everything. He said like they were going to some restaurant and he was just so excited by everything. And and she said. I wonder if there's a place that he doesn't love. <laughs> and yeah. and so he's just that kind of person. He's just always happy and which isn't a bad thing, but I think there wasn't a lot of like depth to him as a person. True. Yeah, I agree with that. I agree with that. Yeah. And would do you have any other characters that you kinda dislike or just, you know, mere? Mm, I don't think so. I think Nora was the one that we got to know the most Mm -hmm. because we spent so much time in her head. But um, the other characters were just people who were kind of helping her understand herself. Yeah. Molly. Uh, Molly was awesome. Molly was one of the... I mean, she was it. I mean, after that life, she was like, no, I am... I want to live. I am alive. And Mm -hmm. that was kind of neat. What... Do you, were you how was your opinion on the ending? Um I think the ending made sense. Um do we want to give spoilers or no? <laughs> I mean, you know, with the nature of this but we kind of know that this is going to end on a happy note. So, yeah. Just for you know, especially when like pandemic going on, all of this was obviously written before pandemic and uh, published like kind of before pandemic started in the states but with the nature of this well you definitely would want a a lighter note because it started out so heavy and i mean you can end heavy but but for but we have to see you know nora grow somehow Mm -hmm. so i think because the nature of the book i i would say everybody kind of can predict the the ending yeah, so I think what I was wondering was, um, you know, obviously, which life would she end up with? Because um, the librarian was telling her that um, if you really like the life that you're in, you know, like any, if you really like any of these alternate lives, then they'll become real. And so Nor- Nora was really like clinging to that thought. 
And it was what like kept her going. Um, and so I was wondering, since she seems so happy in the life with Molly and Ash, would she get to stay in that life? And that's what she was really hoping for, too. And we see that that's not quite the case. She does go back to her actual life, but she realizes that um, that she has the power to make her life what she wants it to be. And so I guess that makes it, that like makes all the difference for her. Yeah. Um, I definitely love the ending. I mean, it is one of the endings that we all hope for, for everybody that is going through, you know, depression like Nora is. Um, and, you know, in that life, not only she realized herself in Molly and then she experienced love from Ash and Molly, she also experienced the little tiny repercussion of of her choices. Like for example, Mr. Benji, her um her neighbor, her neighbor, he he is at a nursing home in this life with like Ash and Molly. And he always swore that he was never gonna end up in a in a nursing home. So she kinda wondered why that was. And then she went also went to see um, her school librarian in that life, Mrs. Elm. And unfortunately Mrs. Elm passed away three weeks before. And another thing that she saw was this kid, uh, I forgot his name, but I think Leo. Leo, I think so. Yeah. Um, Leo is one of the students that she's teaching, pia- uh, she's tutoring piano on. And, and, you know, he came from a pretty much a not so good neighborhood. Her mom, I mean, his mom couldn't really afford that much. And his mom only hired her because, well, she, Nora's pretty cheap and Nora's good and, but most importantly, cheap. So, but in this life with Ash and Molly, she didn't get to teach this kid piano at all. And and this kid turned out to be a um, in a gang and then he was shoplifting and basically he was up to no good in this life. So I like that Nora got to see the little tiny precursion, uh, repercussions of her cho- choices. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, yeah, I think because she didn't get to teach him piano, somehow like that... Um, the hobby of like playing piano for him really kept him out of trouble, which is what happens with a lot of kids. A lot of kids, um, that one thing that really makes everything worthwhile, like a lot of kids, you know, play basketball at school and it's the only reason they go to school Mm -hmm. to like play sports. And for him, I guess it was like playing piano that like kept him out of trouble and stuff. But in that alternate life, he wasn't playing piano and that's why he like ended up getting into trouble and shoplifting and everything and she realizes that because she wasn't teaching piano it led to all of these other things happening or not happening and you know like no matter what like you'll be okay but your actions and decisions do have like effects on other people oh definitely yeah and then so I love I love that ending. And then, you know, the little bit last, I think, five pages where she's struggling to stay alive. Oh, I was on my toes. So I was like, like, is she going to be alive? Did she have all this character growth just so that she can die? Like, yeah. I was I was scared for her. I was I mean, I don't know what I would do. I think I'll be hugely disappointed if Nora somehow couldn't make it back to her real life. Um, mm-hmm. but which I'm glad that she did. And, you know, which again, with the nature of this book, obviously we all know that that's where it's going to go. But, but I was, I was just on my toes. I was like, oh, please, please let her live. Yeah. Yeah. And we saw like how much she actually wanted to live mm-hmm. because I think, I think that's part of all of us. Like, even if we, um, you know, overdose or, um, sometimes we like, and try other methods of self-harm like deep down we actually don't want to die and we're actually just looking for like she was she was looking for connection she was looking for belonging she was looking for like a sense of purpose and she eventually found those things but it wasn't her purpose isn't actually tied to her career or um, relationships or anything it's actually just about being like sure about what she wants yeah and and love just 
loving yourself. Yeah. yeah. And so at the end, she kind of, in her actual life, after going through all of these other lives, mm -hmm. she kind of has all this experience now and all this new knowledge and she uses all of that she uses what she's learned and she reconnects with her brother she reconnects with her best friend and even mrs elm she gets to play chess with mrs elm yeah and she gets to talk to her neighbor yeah and she talked to leo's mom she's like i'm never gonna gonna um miss another lesson and even if you know the mom and i'm not choosing her she say make sure leo keeps going to a piano lesson because Leo is talented, and and I and she even toy with the idea that oh maybe she will us Ash out this time, so that was kind of cute. I was like okay, so she's bringing in the light from this, from from you know the, all these lives that she has mm -hmm. gone through, and then she's finally using that light to see the good of this life even though she just went through and she's almost. yeah she's kind of paying it forward too yeah like because she's been given a second chance she wants to bring light to other people also and so she's going to meet mrs um just to like keep her company and play chess oh yeah well the next question i have for you is well for both of us i guess is um do you have any criticism for this book um writing story you know anything um, I don't think so. I think it was very well written. Um, I think people who really enjoy action and um, even like comedy, this probably isn't the book for them. But yeah. I think it was something that um, that I will come back to at some point. So definitely. Um, and I, for me, I kind of mentioned it earlier uh, about the dialogue thing. That that was like. The only nitpicky thing that I'll have for, you know, for this book, it's just not as flowy as I would like it to be. It's not, most of the dialogue, if you read it, you start to notice that it's long. It's not natural. That, I, how, that was what I would say. It's not, mm -hmm. it's not like conversational. I mean, it is conversational in a sense, but it's just not as flowy as we would be if we are actually talking in real life. Yeah, um, you know, um, one of the things that I would love to to just reach out to Matt Haig is, one, thank you for writing this book. And, you know, I would just ask him how he is. Mm -hmm. yeah, like, I, I, I would just want to, that would be one thing that I want to just ask him. Like, hey, how are you? Just, just talk. Yeah, I wonder yeah. if this was a difficult book for him to write because... I imagine that, um, you know, putting yourself in Nora's shoes um, would require, like, a lot of, like, introspection into your own mind and kind of, like, really feeling all the things that Nora's feeling, which can be really draining, I think. So I wonder if that was difficult for him and how he dealt with all of that. Oh, yeah. Um, and then do you think it was... I, I'm wondering why he chose a girl as the main character as opposed to a boy because Matt is male. So I'm wondering if that was an intentional choice or... You know, I didn't even think about that. Because it's not something that happens very often. Like, usually women writers write girls as main characters and then right. men write boys as main characters. You know, I, I don't know. It could be... It may be because he just wanted a female lead... Uh, female protagonist for the book um maybe because for him his his librarian is you know a female and then he wants to kind of dedicate that to that counselor guidance i'm not sure do you do you have any idea um i i feel like a lot of the things that she's dealing with might be um like more a little bit more easily represented in a girl and maybe his audience was women i'm not sure because a lot of women do deal with um depression and anxiety a little differently than men do and maybe he was hoping that for some reason it was easier to express all of this if it was from the perspective of a woman yeah you know now that you actually mentioned that i would say it could be also the gender issue because you know woman if i if a woman comes up 
uh, and with problems, even though some people would still look down on it. Generally, the society would be like, okay, well, let's listen. But yeah. if a man comes up and have the same problem, unfortunately, society kind of still looks at them and be like, dude, what the heck? Mm-hmm. Like, man up. Come on, man. Right? And so, it's, th- yeah, it's easier to sympathize with yeah. a woman who's dealing with this. Which, I mean, it, I wish that we get better with the gender issues. And uh, while we don't know exactly why he chose uh, a woman ca- female character over a male character i hope that that you know he that society will get better and then he is able to portray how ma- men deals with depression and and um therapy over time yeah i would i would be interested to know if he would ever write um something not this book but something else from the perspective of a boy. So we could see what that would look like. Yeah. Yeah. Well, do you have uh, anything to add for this book? Um, I don't think so. I think, um, thank you so much for listening to our podcast slash YouTube show. Yeah, so we do have a YouTube. And if you're on YouTube, thank you for watching us. And, you know, we are planning to do this uh, regularly. So remember to click subscribe and share well thank you and we'll catch you next time